In this video, Newton's first law of motion will be explored. The idea of the net force will be introduced and the concept of inertia discussed. Next, free body diagrams will be introduced through some common examples showing vector components and the inclined plane. Finally, Newton's first law will be demonstrated through some sample problems. Sir Isaac Newton's three laws of motion describe the relationships between forces and motion. Newton's first law, also known as the law of inertia, states that every object remains in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. The two key ideas here are that the motion of an object, whether at rest or moving at a constant velocity, will not change unless acted upon by an unbalanced force, and that objects have an inherent property to resist accelerations. This property is referred to as the inertia of the object. An object's mass determines its inertia, and it relates to this ability to resist being accelerated. For example, if an unbalanced force acts on an object with a low inertia, or a low mass, it will accelerate. But if the same magnitude force acts on an object with a large inertia, or mass, its acceleration will be much smaller due to its larger inertia. A key aspect of Newton's first law is the idea of total, or net force. The net force, or as it is also known, the resultant force, is the vector sum of all the forces acting on an object. If these forces add to zero, then the forces are said to be balanced, and the object is in translational equilibrium. A zero net force does not mean there are no forces acting on the object. For example, a car moving at a constant speed will have a net force of zero newtons, but there are many forces acting on it that are balanced. If the net force acting on an object is not zero, then there is an unbalanced force, and the object will accelerate in the direction of the unbalanced force. This is the focus of Newton's second law, which is explored in the next video. Free body diagrams are used to identify and analyze all of the forces acting on an object. Let's review the directions of the key forces discussed in detail in the last video. The normal force is perpendicular to the surface of contact between two objects. The force of friction opposes motion. The tension force follows the rope and is always a pulling force. The elastic force is opposite the change in length of the spring. The drag force opposes the motion of an object through a fluid medium. The buoyancy force acts upwards on a body that is immersed in a fluid. And the gravitational force points towards the center of the mass creating the gravitational field. A free body diagram shows all the forces acting on an object, their directions, and their magnitudes carefully included. In a free body diagram, it's useful to draw the forces emerging from the center of mass of the object or originating from the point of application of the force. Let's explore some common examples of Newton's first law with a focus on creating the free body diagram in each case and applying it to explore the forces involved. First, let's consider an object that is at rest suspended from a spring. The gravitational force will be acting downwards on the object, and the spring will be exerting an upwards force. Because the object is in equilibrium, these forces can be drawn with equal magnitudes, so the arrows will be of equal length. If the spring is then removed, the object will begin to fall. After a period of time, the object will be falling at its terminal velocity, so an upward force of air resistance will be acting, which would have the same magnitude as the force of gravity, so the two vectors would be drawn with the same length. If an object sinks towards the bottom of a container at a constant speed, the force of gravity will be acting down, and there will be an upwards buoyancy force acting, as well as a drag force opposing the motion. Because the net force is zero, the magnitude of the force of gravity will equal the sum of the drag and buoyancy forces. If an object is resting on a horizontal plane, a force of gravity will be acting downwards, and there will be a normal force acting upwards, perpendicular from the surface of the plane. Because this object is in equilibrium, these forces are equal in magnitude. Let's explore an object on a horizontal plane further. If a rope is added at an angle, then a tension force will be applied along the direction of the rope. For the block to remain in equilibrium, a friction force between the surfaces will be directed to oppose the motion of the object. The tension force will have a horizontal component parallel to the plane and a vertical component perpendicular to the plane. The horizontal component can be found using the cosine ratio, and the vertical using the sine ratio. This vertical component of the tension force will also lower the magnitude of the normal force. 
A good approach is to analyze the forces in the vertical and horizontal directions separately. Because the net force is zero, the vector sum in both directions must be zero as well. In the vertical dimension, there are three forces acting. The force of gravity is acting down, the normal force and the vertical component of the tension force are acting upwards. So the magnitude of the force of gravity must equal the sum of the normal force and the vertical component of the tension force. In the horizontal dimension, the horizontal component of the tension force is balanced by the force of static friction. It's important to note that the forces are also balanced for an object moving at a constant velocity. The net force is zero in both cases. If the rope is removed and the plane on which the object rests is inclined at an angle theta to the horizontal, then the force of gravity remains unchanged and continues to point downwards, but the normal force is no longer opposite it as it will be directed perpendicular to the surface. In the absence of friction, the object will slide down the inclined plane. Because the object is at rest here, the force of friction will act to oppose the motion, and in this case, point up the incline. Instead of developing equations for the vertical and horizontal directions, it is more useful to select directions parallel and perpendicular to the plane for our analysis of the forces. The components of the force of gravity perpendicular to the plane and parallel to the plane can be found. Examining this in more detail, the angle theta of the inclined plane with the horizontal will be equal to the angle formed between the force of gravity and the component into the inclined plane. By using this angle, the component of the force of gravity perpendicular to the plane is given by the force of gravity multiplied by the cosine of theta, and the component parallel to the plane is given by the force of gravity multiplied by the sine of theta. If we consider the vector sum of these components along the dimensions relative to the plane, for the force into the plane, the component of the force of gravity, the force of gravity times the cosine of theta, must equal the normal force. Along the plane, the component of the force of gravity, the force of gravity times the sine of theta must equal the static force of friction. By carefully considering what forces are acting and their directions through a free body diagram, more complicated situations can be analyzed. Let's consider some sample problems. A mass m is at rest on a frictionless plane inclined at an angle theta from the horizontal held in place by a spring. Sketch the free body diagram for the mass and find an expression for the extension of the spring delta x. If we consider the forces acting on the mass, the force of gravity will be acting straight down, but the normal force will be acting perpendicular to the plane. Because the mass is causing the spring to extend, there will be a spring force acting up the incline. The question states that the mass is at rest, which means that the net force acting on the system must be zero newtons and the mass is in equilibrium. It's always a good idea to draw the free body diagram separately. Let's use vector components to solve this problem. The force of gravity can be broken into its components perpendicular to the incline and parallel to the incline. The perpendicular component of the force of gravity into the incline is given by the force of gravity times the cosine of theta. And the component of the force of gravity parallel to the incline is given by the force of gravity times the sine of theta. So in the dimensions relative to the incline, the normal force and the component of gravity perpendicular to the plane will be opposite each other, and the spring force will be opposite the component of gravity along the plane. So using vector components to solve the problem, we need to consider the forces along the plane. The spring force will be balanced by the component of gravity along the plane. Recall that the gravitational force is equal to the mass times the gravitational field strength, and the spring force is equal to the spring constant times the change in length of the spring. If we sub these relations into our formula and rearrange, we can find that the change in length of the spring will equal the mass times the gravitational field strength times the sine of the angle of the incline with the horizontal divided by the spring constant. Another way of solving this problem would be to do a head-to-tail vector addition. Because there are only three forces and the forces add to zero, when you put the three forces head to tail, they must form a closed vector triangle. This closed vector triangle will be a right angle triangle with the angle between the gravitational force and the normal force equal to the angle between the incline and the horizontal. We can use trigonometry to show that the sine of the angle theta will equal the spring force divided by the force of gravity.
and again recalling our relationships for the gravitational force and the spring force, we can sub into that formula and rearrange to solve for the change in length of the spring. The next example states that a mass m is rising at a constant speed in a liquid. Sketch the free body diagram for the mass and find an expression for the speed of the mass. If we consider the forces acting on the mass, the force of gravity will be acting straight down on the mass, but there will be a buoyancy force pulling upwards on the mass. Because the mass is moving through the liquid, there will also be a drag force opposing its motion. We're told that the object is moving at a constant speed, meaning that the net force on the mass must be zero newtons and the object is in equilibrium. So the buoyancy force pulling upwards must be balanced by the force of gravity and the drag force acting down. We can express this mathematically by saying the buoyancy force will equal the force of gravity plus the drag force. Recall that Stokes law is equal to 6 pi times the viscosity of the liquid times the radius of the mass times the velocity of the mass. And according to Archimedes' principle, the buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the displaced volume, which would be equal to the fluid density times the displaced volume times the gravitational field strength. So we can sub these two relationships into our formula. Using the density definition, we can replace the mass of the object with its density times its volume. Rearranging this equation for the speed of the mass shows that the speed is equal to the volume of the mass times the gravitational field strength times the difference in the density between the liquid and the object divided by 6 pi times the viscosity of the fluid times the radius of the object. In summary, Newton's first law states that an object remains in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. This means that unbalanced forces will cause accelerations. But objects with balanced forces are said to be at equilibrium. They are moving at a constant velocity or at rest. Inertia is a measurement of an object's ability to resist accelerations and is related to its mass. A free body diagram is an important tool for analyzing motion and forces. In a free body diagram, all the forces are shown that are acting on an object, and the magnitude and the direction are demonstrated through vectors. Thanks for watching.